Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for our next presentation. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce myself, uh, which I did not do because I assumed people knew who I was, but uh, perhaps that was an oversight. So I'm Dr. Roger Lear. I'm your uh, MC for the conference. You will be uh, seeing me in this room and uh, downstairs for the uh, special presentations. So um, just uh, let me uh, step aside for a moment and get my material. And if you're just in the meantime, all have a seat. Uh, we will begin. Our next uh, presenter probably really doesn't need any kind of an introduction because we know uh, what he does. We know his uh, field of research, which he's been doing for the past 46 years. He's been uh, on the internet. He's been on coast to coast radio. He's been lecturing all over the world. He has a movie that was done about his research and work, which is on the internet, called Zeitgeist. How many of you ever heard of it or saw it? Zeitgeist has had uh, how many millions now? Well over 15 million. Well over 15 million hits. Jordan Maxwell is an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. Jordan continues as a preeminent researcher and speaker in the fields of secret societies, occult philosophies, and ufology. And he's done that since 1959. His work is not only fascinating to explore, but too important to ignore. For the first time, Jordan will speak about his personal experiences with the unknown. He will talk about how he was exposed to forces and entities not of this realm and not of his control. He will also explain how his future was foretold many years before it manifested and how the spirit who he believes guides us all, was made apparent to him and guided his life. He will be spellbound and amazed by this true story. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the one, the only, Jordan Maxwell. Thank you, Dr. Lear. And I want to thank my host for putting this program on because so very seldom do people get a chance to hear this kind of material. So if it wasn't for our host to put these conferences together, we wouldn't be privileged to hear from the different speakers. Uh, first thing I'd like to say, since this is basically a conference on science of the UFO, I'm giving you my opinion. And this is just one man's opinion. But I'm not impressed with science at all, <laughs> period. I have very little respect for scientists. Um, there are a few scientists in the world that are truly brilliant and wonderful human beings who have done great things for us, such as Nikolai Tesla and uh, Royal Rife and other people of that kind of scientific investigation. But too much of science today uh, is actually a religion. They have their holy men and their saints and their, their dogma. And uh, consequently, science is truly a, a, a disgrace in America and around the world. It is being financed by powerful uh, special interests behind the scenes. And so much of what science gives us today is known by the scientific community to be outright lies. But there are very powerful people sitting in high places who 
finance the science community with their grants. And so I have no respect for, and this again is just my opinion, but I have little to no respect for scientists in this country at all, period. Uh, science is, as I said, become a religion. My specific field that I've always been interested in is religion and theology, especially the ancient world. And from my viewpoint, I would have thought that, s that religion and theology should be more of a science. Because if there's anything actually to the spirit world, then we should really understand it correctly, if it's really something there of value. So religion and theology ought to be very scientific about its exploration of the spirit world. But unfortunately, that's not true. Unfortunately, religion is simply a social arrangement, a social movement, the kind of thing, it's a fraternal order. People go to church, they have no idea in the world where the word church comes from and couldn't care less. They use terms and ideas and concepts that they have no idea where it all came from and it's really not important. It's just a social arrangement. I mean, they talk about God. God is simply the word dog spelled backwards. So, but, and so religion offers very little to nothing except uh, some entertainment for the masses to keep them occupied. Science offers uh, even less. But there is a legitimate uh, de jour group of scientists in the world who are doing things for the human race and who are very honest and, and have the integrity to tell the truth. And usually they will lose their job and be thrown to the dog. So, so that's my feeling about science and uh, religion. I don't have much respect for either. But. Uh, I've been asked many times, how did I get started in this work of doing what I do? And I, I began even at eight years old having other world experiences. I was born and raised in Pensacola, Florida, about a mile and a half from um, a Gulf Breeze, Florida. So I, I grew up with a lot of strange, mystical things happening to me as a child. And I, it, being, being a child, you don't realize what's going on, so you just take it to be, this is what life is like. It was only until later on in life I began to see that other people didn't have the same experience as I, I was having. I don't know if, it, if that's good or bad, it's just that I was experiencing things as a child that most people cannot even relate to. Um, but how I actually got started uh, doing what I'm doing was back in 1959. I left home as a teenager and ended up in Los Angeles in 1959. We're talking 48 years ago. And uh, <coughs> I, I ended up in North Hollywood in Los Angeles. And one morning I was uh, in a restaurant in North Hollywood Saturday morning and the place was absolutely packed and there was no room except one uh, chair at the counter. So I sat at the counter and there was a girl sitting next to me <clears throat> and so we started talking and she was a couple of, she was probably a couple of years younger than I was and I was 19 and so uh, I liked her immediately she liked me so we got along great and so uh, when we were walking home, um, when we were walking home, I lived about three blocks from town, and she lived about five blocks from town. So uh, I started meeting her on Saturdays and Sundays downtown, and then when we would walk home, I had never actually seen where she lived because she lived two blocks further than me, but she knew where I lived. And so one night she came over to my place, and this is back in 1959, I'm 19 years old. And she came over to my place and she said, my dad wants to talk to you. And I told her, I'm not interested to talk to your dad, I got nothing to say to him. And, uh, and he's, she said, no, my dad is a very important man and he wants to talk to you. He's got something to tell you. And it sounded interesting, I trusted her, so I went. 
And for the first time, I, I approached her house. And when I did, her father happened by chance to be coming out the front door. And the moment I saw him, with an immediacy, I had this overwhelming spiritual feeling. I can't describe. It was like a child, or when, when you become frightened about something, you know something is wrong, and it just comes over you that you know there's something bad here. But it wasn't bad what I was feeling. It was a euphoric feeling, a spiritual feeling that I got just seeing this man. And, and I, I really liked the feeling. I just didn't understand it. And the thing I noticed about her father was that uh, instantly was that he was very, very much in control of himself. I sense that this man does nothing by chance. And, and I don't know how I was thinking about this kind of thing at 19 years old, but... And so he said, come on in. And so my girlfriend and I went in, and she had a younger sister. And so the two girls sat on the floor in front of the fireplace. The mother was in the kitchen. Um, I didn't even, she didn't even come out. I didn't even meet her um, that night. And so the father sat on one end of the sofa, and I sat on the other. And so we were making small talk, and he was asking me, how long have you, how do you like living in California? And how are you working? Yeah, how do you like your job, et cetera, et cetera. And my inhibition started to drop, and I started to become more relaxed. But I knew there was something about this guy that just was very, very strange. And, but I liked him. I liked what I was feeling. And um, after a little while of just chit-chatting and talking about things, he said to me, he said, remember when you were back in Pensacola when you were about eight years old and your dad built a new back porch? Remember how the back porch was falling apart and, you built, and he built a new back porch with your uncle and, and he built it out of green lumber and it smelled kind of funny because the lumber was green? He said, remember that? And I, uh, tears were coming to my eyes because it was frightening me. I didn't know how to react to this, and I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but he was scaring me. And he looked at me very, very calmly, and he said, well, did that happen or didn't it? And I said, yes, it did happen. And he says, and one night you were in bed, you were about eight years old, and you were in bed, and you got up, and you went out in the back porch, remember? And the moon was out very bright. And he said, then remember what you did? You sat there and was picking the wood with your fingers because it was green and it smelled funny. And you were chewing on it and smelling the green wood. Remember how you did that? And it's even more frightening to me. And I didn't know what to, how, to, how to answer him. And I just sat there looking at him and nodding and saying, yes, I, I did that. And he says, well, how would I have known that? How would I know that? And I said, I don't know how you know that. And he said, I know that because we were there. You just didn't see us, but we saw you. And I said, I don't understand what you're saying. He said, well, did what I say happen? Did it happen? Yes. Then how would I have known if I wasn't there? And I said, I don't know. I don't even know what you're talking about. And he says, we were there. And what you asked for that night, if you'll remember, and I did remember very clearly, he says, you asked God to let you do something with your life that was very important. You wanted to do something important with your life. Is that what you asked God to do? And I said, yes. And he said, well, we're going to give you an opportunity to do something with your life. And I was just amazed and, and frightened. But I was also intrigued. And he said, um, all your life you've had strange experiences, haven't you? And I said, yes. And he says, why are you here in California? What did you come here for? And I said, I'm not sure. I just had to leave home and this is where I ended up. He said, no, not at all. You're here in California because we brought you here. We're going to train you to do something for us that will come many, many years from now later on in your life. 
but you did ask to do something, so we're going to give you an opportunity to do, to do something for us. And I said, who is us, and what are you talking about? And he says, that's not important right now. What's important is that you are here, we brought you here, and that we have something for you to do, and when the time comes, later on in your life, when the time comes, you will know what you're to do. You will, by that time, know where you're going and why you are doing what you're doing. And he says, so I'm going to start you out on your journey tonight by giving you a book. I want you to read the book, and uh, it will begin a journey for you. And I was 19 years old. And he gave me the book, The Complete Works of Charles Fort. And he began opening the book, just indiscriminately opening the book, and read a, a paragraph. It just blew my mind. What, I couldn't believe what he was reading. It was so fascinating. And then a few moments later, he just indiscriminately opened the book again and read another paragraph, and that, just, that was even better than the one before. And so it appeared that he was just indiscriminately opening the book to, but no, I now know. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly my personality and what would catch my attention. And so he was, he was baiting me. He was acting as if it, these are interesting things that you should know about. But no, I was fascinated with it. And so he said to me, he said, you've always been interested in UFOs and you believe that they exist, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, have you ever seen any up close? And I said, no. And he said, would you like to see some tonight? And I said, yes, I would. And he says, well, come with me. And the girls got up. And the mother still is, I haven't seen her. And so we went out in the front yard, North Hollywood, 1959. And he said, uh, he looked up in the sky and began inaudibly talking. His mouth was moving, but I can't, you, know, you couldn't hear him. But he's talking, looking into the sky. And then he said to me, he turns to me, and he says, they said that they'll be here in a few moments, and they'll be coming from over in Griffith Park, they're going north. There's three of them, and they'll be coming here soon. So just wait. And I said, who's coming? And he said, you'll see. And a few minutes later, we're standing out there talking, and I'm, I, I, and all of a sudden, I see three um, disc-shaped things coming and making no sound whatsoever. And as they came over, they were flying in a, in a, uh, in a tra uh, formation of a triangle. But they're three separate uh, discs. And, and as they came over, they stopped right over us. And it was an extraordinary uh, event for me because I've never seen anything that beautiful in my life. It was it was as if the it was if as if it was like a pie cut into six or eight slices and each slice was a different color, and it was circulating the colors but the colors were very very vibrant like uh, laser colors very brilliant circulating colors but it wasn't circulating so fast as to blend the colors, and he stood there looking at them, I was looking at the three of them sitting there circling with the beautiful colors and. And then I looked over to the two girls, and they're looking at me. And I'm watching him and looking at the... And then a few moments later, they started to move and went off north, and they've left. And I said, what was that? And he said, that's us. And I said, I really don't understand what's going on here tonight. I, I don't know, what, you know who I'm talking to. And he said, that's all right. One day you will know what you're supposed to do. We brought you here to begin your training. So that started me on a whole new, uh, it's like a bullet ricocheting off a rock. What I thought I was doing in California turned out to be going in a totally different direction. And I became very interested in the world of the occult and UFOs and mysticism and ancient and Later on, weeks later, uh, I would go out with him, the two girls, my girlfriend and her sister, and the mother I met finally. And we would drive out to uh, the deserts, way out, like on a Saturday, and, and, we, and he and I would be, the mother and the girls were walking along in the desert, but we would, uh, he and I would go out 
and talk about the alien life forms that are here from different places in the universe. And, and he was kind of just uh, telling me about all the strangeness of the universe and all the strange things going on and the different kinds of aliens that were here. And as a 19-year-old kid, I was just blown away by this stuff. I don't know. I, I didn't understand where it was all going and why I was learning this. But this was the kind of thing that, and then finally, one day I went over to their home, maybe about three months after this had begun, and they were totally gone. The house was totally empty. The girl never came to tell me she was leaving. Uh, nobody called. Nobody told me anything. They're just gone, and they're gone forever. I look back on my life now, and I look back on that, that occasion, and now I understand. I think that he was sent here to you know, to guide me into where I was supposed to go. And once that was done, and it was sufficiently done, then he would move on. I don't know who this man was. I don't know from where he has come, but he impacted my life in a very profound way. And after that, all of a sudden, things started happening to me, and I've had 36 peak experiences in my life. By peak experiences, I mean phenomenally impressive occult or other world uh, things which have happened to me. And I know that so many times when I've talked about this, I'm, I'm actually, I was very hesitant to talk about this subject at all. I much prefer staying with my subject of ancient religions and occultism and government, which I love and and f very familiar with. And I was hesitant to talk about my personal experiences because people will, uh, my detractors and enemies, and, tr and the kind of thing I do has many enemies. And my detractors and enemies will use anything they can find on me to build a case against me. So I don't want to give my enemies um, too much to, uh, to put a knife in my back, but, but I've already had organizations talking about Jordan Maxwell sounds like he's off the wall and should be put in the hospital seeing aliens and all that. And, I, and all I would say to my audience is that's what happened to me. I'm being very honest with you. I don't know where these entities have come from. I don't know where these things have come from. Um, I've been told, but I, I can't swear to it in a court what it is I've seen and what I've experienced. All I know is I've had 36 peak major experiences in my life which have brought me to the place that I am today where I am totally convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are not alone. And this is why I said in the beginning that I have little to no respect for scientists because today science is not truly in the hands of scientists. My concept and idea of a scientist is someone who is open-minded because uh, your mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. And so I would consider that, I would understand that a scientist would be open-minded, interesting, and intrigued with strange things that are happening in the world and trace down why and get the facts. But scientists are not interested in the world of the occult because they can't, they can't uh, deal with it. They've never had any experiences with it and they consider it to be something of, uh, uh, you know, a sleight of mind. So most scientists are not open-minded or intelligent or wise. There are people like Albert Einstein who was very interested in the world of the occult and metaphysics and um, the, the world that we don't see. But too many scientists today are just religionists. I had another experience that uh, was, I, as I said, I've had 36 of them, but another one that was very heavy impact, impacted me. I was uh, invited to speak at a conference in uh, Pasadena back in 1991 uh, with uh, Norio Hayakawa and Gary Schultz. Some of you might know the name. And it was a very, very successful, very large UFO expo. And I was a keynote speaker on Saturday morning. And a, a few days before the event, uh, I went with Norio and Gary to the hotel 
to figure out, uh, they wanted to plan the strategy. What, what, it, what kind of a presentation are you going to be given? Uh, do you need a blackboard? Do you need a screen? What, what kind of a presentation? And so I said, no, what I want to do is I want a table on the, on the platform. I want a table and a chair so I can lay out all kinds of paperwork on the table like a teacher before a class and, uh, and, and that's the kind of a presentation I want to do. And so Noriel said, all right, then what we will do, because we've already set this up anyway, we're going to have uh, large television sets around the room, and we'll have, uh, we'll have someone sit behind you on a, on a bar stool with a video camera right over your shoulder so that when you are talking to the audience, pick up the paper and hold it so that he can, fo he can home in on it and people can read it on the on the television. And so it worked fine. Saturday morning came, I did a two hour presentation on occultism and religion and government. And afterwards it went off just fine and uh, the guy who was filming me uh, asked me, he said, my, my wife and I would like to have you come over for dinner tonight. This is back in 91. And I said, fine. And he, as it turns out, he lived right there in the Pasadena area. And so I go over there that evening with uh, just him and his wife. And um, we're sitting there. He and I are sitting in the front room chatting, talking about today's events and whatever, and UFOs. And his wife is in the kitchen cooking. And a few minutes later, she comes out right in the middle of our conversation. She comes out and she says to him, she said, have you told him yet? And it shocked me. And, and he says, no, I wasn't going to tell him till later. And I said, tell me what? And he says, I, I don't like it, uh, surprises. And he said, well, I was going to tell you after dinner. And he said, I'll tell you now something that I've told my wife and something I've told all my friends for many years. Now I will tell you. He said, when I, was, when I was 17 years old, I just turned 50 a couple of weeks ago, but when I was 17 years old, I was on the East Coast. I think he said something like Massachusetts or one of those states on the East Coast, New England. And he said, I was thumbing a ride one, one summer day. I was thumbing a ride going north to, to spend some time with my cousin. And he said, an old man picked me up in a pickup truck. And he said that... The old man was very old and the pickup truck, it was a wonder it could even drive. The thing was so old and falling apart. And he says, and when I got in, he said, the first thing this old man did was started telling me everything about my life. There was not one thing about my family or my life that he didn't know actu ac accurately. And he went on and on telling me about my dad, his work, my mother, her friends, my, my sister. And, he said, we, and I, he said, I was just amazed listening to this old man tell me everything about my life. And he said, when he let me out, he said to me, everything I've been telling you till now is to be entertaining and getting your attention. He said, now I'm going to tell you something important. After you're 50 years old, you're going to be on the West Coast. And... You're going to be on a stage one day, you're going to be on a stage with a man who has a table and a lot of papers laid out, and he's going to be before a large audience, and he's going to be talking about conspiracies in government and, and religion. And you're going to be sitting behind him on a high chair, you're going to be sitting behind him with a camera, and that camera does not exist today, but it will then. And that camera will allow you to, uh, to film him what he's talking about so that the audience can see it. Now when that happens, and it won't happen until you're after 50, when that happens, you tell that man that I told you he was going to be there at that table talking about that subject. You tell him I told you that. So he will know that it is not by mere chance that he decided to sit at the table. No, no, we've decided that now. So you tell him that. Well, that's like, I don't know, he's 17 and after 50, so that, that many years later, I'm sitting on a stage talking to people. I thought I was being clever by the way I put this, set this thing up, only to find out, no, 
This guy told me, no, no, a long time ago I was told you were going to be sitting at this table doing exactly what you did today. And I've told everybody, now I'm telling you. They told me you would be here doing this. And it frightened me so bad I got up and left the house and went out for a walk and I was shaking because this is the kind of thing that, that keeps reoccurring in my life. And so uh, over and over again I have had these kind of other world, for lack of a better term, other world experiences. And uh, I don't talk about them publicly very much, but I've been asked to speak about it today. I, uh, the, I guess the reason why this is important and why I feel it's important is because so much has been said concerning the UFO field that um, has been put down, marginalized by the powers that be. Well, now understanding after 48 years of studying the world of the occult and government and religion, and by occult, it's simply the word occult simply means hidden. It doesn't mean anything bad or evil or demonic. It means hidden. It's a Latin word. And so studying the hidden world of government and the hidden world of religion and the entire hidden world of how the earth really works, I now see the importance of the kind of thing that I was learning as a teenager and as I was growing up, I now see that there is something now for that I am, I don't know how to say it, I've been pushed into doing, I've been brought here to do, and that is to expose the foundations of world religions and world government. You have no idea in the world how far from the truth the world as it is presented to us really is. I will guarantee you that there is nothing in this world that you understand about the world you live in, about the government you live under, about the politics of the world that you see every day, um, in banking, education. Uh, there's nothing in the world that you experience today that is real. 99% of it is a lie straight across, and scientists have, have, have purposely joined in the deception because it pays a lot, and they get their grants from federal and state grants, and they get their grants from private industry. A lot of money changes hands to keep their mouth shut and tell, and tell the public what the public wants to hear. So that's why I have no respect for science, basically speaking. I have even less respect for religion because I know where the religious movements and organizations have actually come from. Once you begin to see how this stuff really works, I believe, and I've said this on, I've said this to George Norrie a couple of times and I'm saying it again, it is just my opinion, but I am totally convinced for myself that the world that we live in is being orchestrated and run by non-humans. That's just my opinion. But I should not be a bit surprised to learn that the entire world, we have been led by other world entities who look like us. Let me give you a reason why I'm saying that. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis 18, there is a story about Abraham and Sarah. And the scripture says in Genesis 18 that uh, Abraham one day happened to have three men come up into his camp where he was camped. And these three men were coming through and Abraham ran out and bowed down to these three men and said, what is my Lord saying to his servant? Well, that's a strange thing for a prophet in the Bible to do is to run out to three strange men and bow down and say, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? And the three of them, um, one of the spokesmen, the Bible says in Genesis 18, one of the men said, we're on our way to take care of some business. We don't have time to stop. And it says that Abraham insisted that they at least stop to have something to eat and then they could go. And they said, no, they were busy and they were on their way someplace and they had to go. And the Bible says that Abraham insisted that they at least stay for a few moments and have something to eat. 
And so the, it says the spokesman for the three said, all right, but make it quick. And it says that Sarah then quickly fixed uh, something for them, for the three men to eat. And the three men sat under a tree with Abraham, and they talked while the men ate. Then two of the men got up and left, but the main man, the Bible says, stayed and talked with Abraham. And the Bible says, not me, I'm just telling you what the scripture says in the Old Testament. The Bible says that this was the Almighty God in all capital letters, the Almighty God himself. And that he was accompanied by two angels or two other entities that we would call angels. And then in Genesis 19, you continue to read the same two angels that got up. That remember, they all three looked like men. And they all three sat under a tree and had dinner. Then the two of them got up, and, they, and, the, and that's in Genesis 19, the two men that went into Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you'll remember in the Bible story in Sodom and Gomorrah, the uh, homosexuals thought that the, uh, uh, these two men were good-looking, handsome men. This is in the Bible in Genesis 19. Well, those two good-looking, handsome men were the same two men who were just sitting under the tree with, with uh, Abraham and Sarah having dinner. Uh, and so that opened up a whole can of worms for me many, many years ago. And I used to call uh, Rabbi Marvin Antelman, who was a very important rabbi in America many years ago. And he and I used to talk about these things often. And he said to me, uh, he said, first of all, why is it in, in the Hebrew that God says, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness? And he says, nowhere in the Bible, uh, Rabbi Antelman said, nowhere in the Bible does God say that he created man. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say God created man. Does it say that? It says, God said, or God said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, not make man. Man's already here. But come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And he says, so this is the word Elohim in the Hebrew scriptures. And so we went on to, he went on to discuss how in Genesis 1-1, where it says that God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in the original Hebrew. It says in the original, in the beginning, the Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is not God. Elohim is a plural, a feminine plural, which should be correctly translated. The King James people were great on the King's English. They didn't know that much about Hebrew. And so it's correctly translated, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. And the gods said, come let us. Because I, you ask yourself, who is God talking about in Genesis 126? When he says, come let us make man in our image. Come let us? Who is us? Well, if there is more than one, and if they are remaking man. So what it appears to be saying in the, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, Genesis is that we are not created by God. We were indigenous creatures that were already here. Now that, that opens up a whole can of worms in itself. Where did the, the actual original creatures like the uh, Neanderthal and these other hominids come from? But that's, that's irrelevant to what I'm talking about now. But if we're reading the scripture correct, and if it's true, then it's saying that someone came here from somewhere out there. And you can ask a seven-year-old child, where is God? They'll point out there. Well, that's true. They're out there. And where do angels come from? Well, they're out there with God. Angels out there. Angel simply means messenger of God. Consequently, even a child would tell you that the higher powers of, of, of creation in the universe, God and the angels, are out there. Well, I hate to tell you this, but out there is extraterrestrial. And the scripture says that they came here and said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So today, we humans look like the gods who created us, according to the scripture. If that is true, I'm not, I wasn't there, but if that's true, or if it has any validity at all, 
it begins to appear at least conceivable to talk about that maybe the people who are running this planet who look like very impressive men are not actually human in fact and I tend to believe for myself that this is actually the case I do not believe that this country or the world in general is in the hands of normal human beings I don't think we're being run by normal human beings normal people do not do to the earth what the people who are running this planet do so it would not surprise me I don't know I'm just theorizing it would not surprise me if we found that the people in power today are actually not of this world and that would explain why they don't give a damn about human life they have no concept of freedom liberty and justice for all they couldn't care less they are not from this world they do not live on this planet with us they are here to subjugate the human race they are here to Im Im imprison the human race and treat us all as if we are nothing more than slaves in a slave camp so I don't have any uh, I don't have any concern about the politics of the world that we live in I'm far more concerned about who really is owning and running this planet who really created us in point of fact because the man that I met back in 1959 was an extraordinary man and I have had other extraordinary people tell me things and do things in front of me and that I saw them do that was absolutely inhuman and no human could do so I, I am persuaded to believe that we are actually in the presence uh, of alien life forms that look like us uh, I don't know where I'm going with all of this but I feel it's very important because I would not be a bit surprised if scientists and, sci and people at the very top of this world know this for a fact and are in league with uh, aliens who look like humans uh, there's all kinds of stories we've heard all kinds of stories like that in the UFO community and for many years I'm not talking about just recently with Steven Spielberg Steven Spielberg is a lot of things but stupid is not one of them and this and this man has produced and directed so many UFO movies and he did he did a television series which was like I don't know 15 to 19 hour series uh, called Taken aliens who came here who look like humans who have abducted humans uh, I don't know if you have ever thought about this but if you are going to finance Steven Spielberg movie for a 90 minute movie you better have a lot of money because he is not cheap he, he's the best there is and consequently if you think about how much money it must cost to finance Steven Spielberg's movies well Steven Spielberg made a 17 hour television series just on aliens who are abducting humans he's made all kinds of movies from E.T. to Close Encounters to all all kinds of different uh, along with uh, poltergeist and other strange uh, stories what I'm suggesting is that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are not stupid they're trying to tell you something they're trying to prepare the human race and they are highly financed they are extraordinarily well financed to do anything they want to do so anytime and I've lived in Hollywood for 48 years I know Hollywood and I know anytime you are highly financed and promoted uh, where's the money coming from and why is there such a concentration on this idea of, of humans of aliens who look like humans I am just suggesting again I go back to the fact I have no respect for scientists because I have heard too many people who are supposedly intelligent scientists put down marginalize and mock and generally make fun of people who have seen and experienced strange things and saying they're, they're losing their mind no I think what's happening is that 
somebody is trying to tell us something and I think whoever it is that's here they're here and they're they're working their work on us today so when you hear the word God and you see churches you better start thinking about what's really behind the Pope I mean if you start thinking about the symbols that are used in religion and churches and what these words really mean and where they really come from and trace back how is it that some man like the Pope has such a profound power over the world that begins to smell like it's otherworldly there's nothing of any decency or honor or good in the Roman system but he has a powerful hold on the world and I'm wondering why <clears throat> so there are, um, there are other experiences I could go on like I said um, one thing happened to me uh, in, in Hawaii I was sitting with my wife and some friends many years ago in Hawaii and I was sitting right across the street from the Hawaiian village and I had my back to the door in a restaurant was sitting there talking and all of a sudden someone came in behind my back through the front door and, it, and I got an electrical shock through my system as if someone came up behind you with live wires and, and hit you and you're not seeing it coming and the electrical shock went through my system and I jumped and knocked stuff on the floor Inadvert I mean, uh, involuntarily I just jumped and knocked food all over in the floor and there was a voice in my head says get up and run you're in trouble your life is in danger run and I got up and ran across the restaurant I ran to the back and the voice says go through the back door there's a back door and I ran through the back door I'm a grown man I'm running and I ran out the back door and another voice said go across the street run quick you're in trouble run quick and I ran across and I screamed to I, I yelled I can't run across the street this is the main boulevard there are cars I said run there won't be any cars and I just ran involuntarily ran across the street and when I did just by chance there happened to be no cars at that moment I ran around to the outside of the Hilton Village and I sat down on this on this little bench outside in the uh, and the voice said you're all right now you're safe now I've had that happen to me twice once in Los Angeles and once in Hawaii where I was in Los Angeles I'm sitting in a restaurant and two guys peripheral vision I saw two men walk in electrical shock hit me and and immediately the a voice kept saying to me get up get out of here you're in trouble run quick and I got up and ran out and I ran up uh, uh, Fairfax Boulevard I ran for about three or four blocks and the voice kept saying run you're in trouble it's your life and I ran and I and then the, then the voice said all right you're okay settle down and sit down and I sat on the bus stop and for about 15 minutes trying to catch my breath thinking what in the hell did I just do <laughs> it makes no sense to me at all uh, I, and I have had too many experiences in my life that tells me that we are being visited and for those people who have never had these kind of experiences I can understand their doubting and at this point I have arrived at a point in my life at 67 years old doing what I have done for 48 years I don't really care what other people think the only thing I care about as, as my detractors and enemies lying and making something out of what I say to show that I'm mentally deranged or, or working for the devil. Or, no, these are things which have happened to me uh, which have taught me that we are actually um, being manipulated by a higher power. We are being, I can't say who because I don't know who, but I have seen way too many examples of how the world is being run from behind the scenes um, and so that's why I feel that this particular subject is important at this particular event because too much of science has has put down and um, marginalized the idea of extraterrestrials I don't the Bible doesn't all the ancient religions in the world the Hindus and all the ancient uh, well-established ancient religions of the world have tales and stories 
of aliens who look like humans who have been here. Incidentally, uh, there's a world of difference between angels and sons of God. And the Bible talks about the sons of God. Uh, they were the watchers. That's a totally different word than angel. So in the scriptures, there's different kinds of entities. Uh, one is called angels. Those are spirit entities, according to the scripture, and according to reference works. But there's another kind of entity the Bible talks about is the sons of God. Sons of God are not angels. We're told in Genesis that the sons of God came down and mated with the women, and they had offspring. And these offspring were the giants of old. And so I can imagine, I mean, I cannot imagine some hideous creature from another world talking a woman into bed. <laughs> but I can imagine a good-looking, handsome man. Well, that's exactly what the homosexuals said, that they were good-looking, handsome men. But messing with them, they found out, no, they're not just men. They look like men. But they have extraordinary powers because we are made in their image. They are here as our, as our uh, creators. We have been made in their image to look like them. Um, I, don't see, uh, I don't see that this is so far out at all. Because I have studied for over 40 years, I have invo involved myself in the study of the ancient religions and occultism, simply meaning the hidden side of theology and religion. And I'm, I am of the opinion that this is going to be, in the near future, a very, very big subject. Um, one other important point in concerning the Bible. Um, in the Genesis 9, Genesis 9, this is after the flood of Noah's day. The Bible says uh, in Genesis 9, 1, that God said to Noah and his sons, God says to Noah, after the flood, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. So I call Rabbi Antelman, and I ask him, I said, is this a correct translation of go forth, um, uh, Noah as being told by God, go forth, multiply and replenish the earth and he says what part of that are you questioning I said the word replenish re means do again and he said well of course if God has wiped out the whole human race in a flood and if you want people on the earth then you got to replenish so the word is absolutely correctly translated replenish means do it again and I said, well, the reason I'm asking is because in Genesis 1.28, where God is creating Adam and Eve, he says the same thing, go forth, repro uh, go forth and uh, reproduce and replenish the earth, meaning do it again. Therefore, Adam and Eve are not the first human beings. God is saying replenish the earth, do it again. And at that point, he said, well, of course, if you understand Genesis 1-2, then it would make sense. Genesis 1-2 is mistranslated in the King James Bible. And the King James Bible, Genesis 1-2 says, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No, the gods created the heavens and the, and the, and the earth. But Genesis 1-2 says, and the earth was without form and void. And he said, that's a mistranslation. That's not what it says in Hebrew. The words in Hebrew for, and the earth became, I mean, and the earth was without form and void, is a Hebrew term, tohu va vohu. Tohu va vohu. And tr translating tohu va vohu, you should correctly read Genesis 1-2. And, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. Not it was without form and void. How could God create something that has no form and it's void, whatever that means? No, it's a mistranslation. Genesis 1-1, and the gods created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. Tohu vavohu is only used twice in the Bible. Once in Genesis 1-2, and once in Jeremiah the prophet Jeremiah, the second chapter, where Jeremiah says, I was laying on my bed and I was given a vision by God. 
And I saw the earth when it was a meeting place for the Elohim. But there was no man found on the earth. There were beautiful cities and beautiful structures, uh, Jeremiah says. In my vision, I saw the earth when it was a beautiful place with beautiful cities. And it was a meeting place of the Elohim. Or translated, it was a meeting place of the gods. But there was no man and then Jeremiah says, and then I saw in the vision, tohu vavohu, the earth became a waste and a desolation. What that is saying is that the earth has been around for a long time, millions and millions of years, and I am totally uh, uh, sure that Michael Cremo and others who are writing on this subject are right when they're saying mankind has been on this earth for hundreds of millions of years, and we are the product of a higher power in the universe that has created us. We look like them and we better start waking up and finding out who's really running your government, your religion, and where are you going and who are you really? What is really coming on this earth? And we know something bad is coming. I think, as uh, the Knights Templars used to say, as above, so below. I think the things we are experiencing now, it implies something bad is coming in the universe. And I think Steven Spielberg, George Lucas with their Star Wars, I think there's something very serious coming. And I think the world is watching it come and they have no idea in the world we're being played for fools. There's a higher order in the universe. It's smarter than we are. And that's why I have no respect for religion or science because neither one know anything about this. I want to thank you for being here. Wow, now after that, that's either going to uh, spurn your appetite or kill it. But uh, we'll take our uh, lunch break and uh, be back uh, promptly at, um, let's see, looks like 1.30 for Dr. John Alexander.